Thank you everyone for coming to my talk, last slot, the last day of the conference, uh, and up against some pretty stiff competition too, like rockets and all sorts of other cool stuff, so it's very good. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about LD Preload and some of the fun that you can have with it. Um, first of all, does everybody know what dynamic linking is? Does anybody not know what dynamic linking is or how it works? Good, very good. <laughs> okay, so there's going to be four parts to my talk today. Um, first of all, I'm going to just have a quick um, overview of dynamic linking and how it relates to um, LD Preload. Then there'll be a review of um, things that people have done with LD Preload in the past. Uh, there's a lot of LD Preload hacks out there. Um, in the third section, I'll show you how to go about writing a preload library if you want to. Uh, and in the final section, uh, we'll look at a couple of advanced things um, that I've been working on using LD Preload. Okay. So, ordinarily, when you run a dynamically linked program, uh, the dynamic linker will go ahead and load up the shared libraries that it needs from the system, and it'll just do them in whatever order that it finds it needs them. LD preload is a magic environment variable uh, in the same way that LD library path can be used to affect where the dynamic linker looks for the libraries. LD preload tells the dynamic linker, this is a list of libraries to load first before any other libraries have been loaded. Um, so it's a colon separated list of libraries. Um, for historical reasons, it also can be space separated. Uh, so you need to watch out for that sometimes. Um, any of the entries in it that have a slash in them are treated as file names, so they could be either relative or absolute, uh, but they will be looked up directly. Any entries that don't have a slash are treated as just the name of a library, and the dynamic linker will go through and search for those in the same way that it does any other library. So for example, the first line here tells the dynamic linker to load the C library before any others. And it'll find the C library from wherever it normally finds the C library. Uh, whereas the second case here tells the dynamic linker specifically load this exact file. So presumably this might be a test version of glibc that you've compiled up specially. And you want to give it a go without actually installing it system wide. Uh, which either usually requires a reboot or can be tricky to do on a running system and terribly easy to get wrong. Um, so if you're interested in all of the gory details on the dynamic linker, then the ld.so man page is what you're after. Um, I mention this because if you do man ld, you'll get the um, compile time linker info. Uh, ld.so is the name of the dynamic linker. And uh, if you were aware of that, it's a bit of a non-obvious name. Okay, so we can preload a library and load it before any others. So what? Preloading means that the functions in the preloaded library, are, and actually not just functions, but all symbols, so um, global variables as well, uh, they'll be used before, in preference, to the functions or symbols from any other library that's loaded later. And this is how you use LD preload to either override or replace or intercept um, typically functions in other libraries. So the upshot of this is that it lets you modify the way that programs behave in a non-invasive way. When I say non-invasive, I mean you don't have to touch that target program at all. You don't have to recompile or relink or anything. So this is really good if you're stuck with a, uh, a closed source program and you don't have the source code so you can't modify it and you need to change how it's behaving. It's also good when sometimes there are some cases of um, modifications that you want to do and it doesn't really make terrible, terribly much sense to put those modifications in either the library or the program itself, even if you might have the source code for both of those. Uh, and we'll see an example of that later on. 
Okay, so it's possible also to preload libraries on a system-wide basis. Um, so of course the obvious way to do that is to just export the LD preload environment variable uh, in the system-wide etc. profile. Um, so this is overridable by users in the sense that they can then later unload LD, uh, unset LD preload or add to it, change it, whatever. Uh, so another way of doing it is there's an etc. ld.so.preload file. Uh, and this has a list of shared libraries in much the same way that etc. ld.so.conf has a list of directories to search. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that the libraries in that file are loaded before the ones from the environment variable. And the permissions on that file usually mean that users can't override those libraries being preloaded. But you need to be careful if you're going to do this kind of thing. And the reason is that the, uh, the preloaded libraries will be preloaded for all the dynamic Linux programs that run on the system. And sometimes this can have unintended consequences um, that you weren't expecting. So you need to be careful. And usually the, uh, the better way to do it is in a more targeted kind of way where you just set the LD preload for the particular program that you're trying to run. Uh, so you can do that on the command line itself. Um, in whatever way you like. So there's some issues to be aware of when you're using LD preload. Um, the first is the most obvious one. This only works for dynamically linked programs. So if you have a program that's statically linked, none of this applies at all. That program will just run as it always does. And uh, that can be good or bad depending on the situation. Uh, in the case of slash bin slash um, SLN, that's a very good thing. If you've had to use that, then you'll know why. Um, the other thing is that it will also affect all the child processes. So even in the targeted case here, if some program goes off and runs other things, like with the system call um, or exec or fork and exec, whatever, then uh, those programs, if they're dynamically linked, they'll also be affected. And again, this may or may not be what you want. Uh, if it's not what you want, then your LD preload library has to take the effort of uh, removing itself out of the LD preload environment variable. Uh, another big one is with um, set UID and set GID programs. Um, so fairly obviously if you allowed libraries to be preloaded uh, and anyone can make a preload library, if you could then use that with a set UID root program, you could basically run anything you like as root. So the rule is that only libraries which appear in the standard paths, so that's the ones in named in etc. ld.so.conf, and that are also set UID or set GID in the same way as the program, only those libraries will be preloaded. Everything else will be ignored. Um, you can only override library functions in this way and not system calls. Um, and so for all intents and purposes, system calls are sort of like uh, function calls into the kernel space. Um, however, glibc is fairly nice. It has wrappers for nearly all of the uh, Linux system calls, and they are fair game. So you can happily intercept them and, and modify them. Uh, and the other thing, the final thing is that because your, um, your preload library is sort of running, but it's kind of hooking itself into the dynamically linked program, um, the only real way to get options and parameters into that is through the environment. Uh, if you wanted to get really fancy, you could um, use getopt or popt or something to parse everything in um, the environment variable. But at any rate, you usually will use the environment in some way or another. OK, so existing um, preload hacks. Um, they, most of them tend to fall into these vague, broad categories. Um, these are pretty vague, really. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is go through a few of these, um, some of the better ones, um, some of the ones which really illustrate the, how powerful um, LD preload can be. Um, and there's heaps more around. Um, just doing a Google search or a FreshMate search for LD preload will find you heaps and heaps. So file system shenanigans, um, playing around with the file system. Um, a lot of these were used before Fuse came along uh, and gave a, a proper solution to this sort of problem. Um, so 
if you intercept all of the calls in glibc that deal with the file system, then you can change how they act. And in this case, when I say deal with the file system, I mean anything that's passed or returns a file name or a path. So things like open, make do, open do, and so on. So a good example of this is um, a project called FLCAL, file link copy on write. Um, and so what this preload library does is break hard links when writing to files. So uh, for a demo, suppose we've got a copy of the kernel source lying around. Uh, this is an old one. So it's 300 megs or so. You might want to take a copy of this and make a few changes. If you just directly copy it, that's another 300 megs gone, and um, it'll also take probably at least 10 or 20 seconds at least. Um, so as um, Hugh Bennings mentioned in his talk yesterday, if you were there, uh, a good way of dealing with this is to copy the tree using symbolic or hard links. In this case, we're using hard links, and that's what the minus L specifies to CP. So now we've got two copies. And you can see that this second test copy here is pretty small uh, because it's basically just the spaces for the directories. And all the files are hard links back to files in the original tree. So that's, that's good. We've saved on disk space and time. Um, now if we want to update the local version and add dash test in here, for example, um, then we can do that, and that's fine, except that because the files are hard linked together, we've actually changed both of them because these two files are actually the same file. If we rewind and go back and instead use the FLCAL preload library and we, pass it, we tell it that we want it to uh, operate on all the files under the current directory, then now when we go and edit the file, we find that it's, the change has been made in only this copy of the file and not that one. The reason for that is that when uh, VI opens the file for writing and makes changes to the file, FLCAL intercepts that and breaks the hard link. So it makes a copy of the file so that now there are two separate copies uh, and then the write goes through to one of those as always. Um, so now you can see that we still have saved on disk space. Uh, it's a little bit more now because the file has been copied on write. That's pretty cool. Um, there's a couple of other worthwhile file system related things. Um, there's a project called PlasticFS, which intercepts everything um, and then has a very flexible um, filter system that allows you to go through and um, do all sorts of different things um, to, to the, the file system's appearance. Um, another classic one is install watch, uh, which is one of these things that you can run uh, when you type make install and it will record a log of all the files that were touched and modified in any way um, by that process. Um, so various, uh, various other packages are built on top of that. Uh, so in the same way you can also play games with the network, make it appear different than it actually is. Um, so two examples of this, one is libshape, which is basically user space traffic shaping. So it just pays attention when you open sockets and then, uh, according to how it's configured, when you uh, read or write to or from those sockets, it just adds sleeps as necessary to slow things down. So it's pretty crude and brute force, but it works. Um, and if you're on a system where you need that kind of thing and you can't use a proper kernel space solution, then it can be useful. Um, NetJail is another one which controls how programs can access the network, um, typically by refusing access to it and just returning um, connection refused. Um, there's a variety of things that are useful for debugging and testing. So one thing that you can do is force um, library functions to fail when they otherwise wouldn't. So one example is a project called fail malloc. Um, so this intercepts malloc and variants um, and basically there's a v you can configure it a few different ways uh, and they just return null more often than they would ordinarily. Um, and you can see some interesting things with that without having to um, go to the effort of auditing the source code. Um, there's another one, libeatmydata, which um, as the name suggests, it's from uh, Stuart Smith, who gave a talk the other day on 
um, eating data and the importance of F-Sync. Uh, and this library basically just disables F-Sync and all its friends. So you can see how fast your code can do um, I.O. and how spectacularly it can eat your data um, if it happens to crash at the wrong time, uh, if your system crashes. Um, so another thing that you can do rather than forcing failures is to um, watch important functions and pay attention to them. Uh, and there are two good examples of this. Electric Fence uh, by Bruce Perrins and Tridge's SegV Handler. Um, so Electric Fence has been around for a while um, and it's been around for a while in LD preload form as well. Um, so basically the idea is when you ordinarily call malloc, you just get a bunch of memory the size you asked for, you get a pointer back to the start of that. Um, what Electric Fence does is uh, it intercepts those calls, it asks for a little bit more, and these extra bits at the start and the end, it marks them as protected using mprotect, and um, it marks them as uh, unable to be read or written to, basically. Um, so it receives this pointer back here from the real malloc, and then it gives you back this pointer here. So now if your code accidentally runs over the edge of either of these, um, uh, of either end of your array, um, then, electric, then actually the program will just segv straight there on the exact instruction that has caused the overrun or underrun. Um, and so then you can analyze it using GDB as normal. So that's really good. Um, the segv handler is uh, a very small um, preload library. Um, it basically just installs a signal handler for segvs and bus errors, which will just run GDB on the current process and dump a backtrace uh, into a log file somewhere on the system. Um, so the great thing about this is that you can install it system-wide and there's no, no overhead at all because you're just installing a normal signal handler. Um, any program which is intelligent enough to have a signal handler for segvs and stuff is um, unaffected completely um, because when the program installs its signal handler, it'll just override this one. Um, an interesting effect would be if this uh, library, it could also intercept the signal call and um, force itself and its signal handler to always be in the way. Um, but the code is really very small, 34 lines. Um, and this is a good example of how you can have an LD preload library which is very small, very simple, uh, low overhead and gives you a good benefit. Uh, moving slightly more advanced, um, because graphics is usually done through libraries of various sorts, uh, you can also intercept those libraries to do interesting things. Um, so one good example of that is libgl fps. Um, so this intercepts um, OpenGL calls and it basically just adds a frame rate display to them, uh, to, to programs that don't already have one. So for example, Okay. So if we run GLX gears, GLX gears, and there's a wrapper program called um, GLFPS, which will set up the uh, LD preload variable, and it just adds the frame rate display in the corner of the window. So you can do the same sort of thing with any GL, OpenGL program. So that's Atlantis from X screensaver, same, same story. So this is a great example of um, how you can get benefit using LD preload. Um, even though you've got the source code for all of these things, it doesn't really make sense to modify OpenGL to add a frame rate display. Uh, by the same token, you wouldn't want to modify every single OpenGL program individually to do that. Um, and so this library is a good example of, um, of the benefit that you can get with LD preload. Okay, so now we'll move on to um, how you actually go about writing these things. So if you just want to replace functions, then you can just do that by including a function of the same name uh, in your preload library. But if you want to intercept a function, then you've somehow got to get access to the original uh, function. And the way you do that is by the, um, the functions in this 
DL function header file. There's two main ones, DL open and DL sim, um, and we'll see those in more detail later on. Uh, and you need to link against the DL library, because that's where DL open and DL sim and the rest of them, the rest of the functions are located. So you basically need minus LDL on your link line. So to motivate the problem, um, suppose, and this is a situation that has happened um, to me and others, um, suppose you have some closed source application, it's a multi-threaded application and you're stuck with it. You have to use it, you've got no choice about that, the powers that be uh, decree it. And the problem is that this app is behaving badly. Um, it's looking at how many CPUs you've got in the system and just using that to spawn that many threads. And there's no way to stop it from doing that. No configuration option or anything. So we don't want it to do that because we want to run it on a uh, shared multi-user system where each user only gets a couple of the CPUs or cores uh, on the actual system. So we can dig around a little bit with um, strace, ltrace, gdb and so on. And eventually we find out that this application is calling sysconf, which is a C library function for finding out runtime uh, configuration parameters and it's passing in n processes conf. So it's asking sysconf for how many processes are configured in the system at this point in time. So we want a preload library which overrides the return value of sysconf in this case. So this is an example of behavior finessing um, that I mentioned in section 2. Um, so this library is called libsysconf cpus um, that's the URL there where you can download it if you want. But we'll go through it now from ground up to see as, as a good example of how you go about creating a preload library. Uh, so we'll have five versions. We'll start off with an empty base project, basically just to show how you use autoconf and automake to do preload libraries. Um, then we'll add some code for debugging and library initialization, intercept sysconf, adjust its behavior, and then a few extra bells and whistles. So the configure.ac file, this is the first half of it. Um, the first block here is basically just standard generic autoconf and automake setup stuff. You specify the name of the project, the version, a source file, and so on. Um, we tell autoconf that we want to check for a variety of programs, so in this case the C compiler, install, and ln. Uh, we then say we want to use libtool and we want to enable shared libraries and disable static libraries because there's no point building a static version of a preload library. Uh, we want to use libtool for that. Uh, we then check for uh, standard stuff, standard headers and so on. Uh, and then there's generic autoconf and automake concluding stuff, basically just telling you where your make files are. Um, so in the makefile.am, so this is the automake make file. In the base directory we just tell it all the code is in the source subdirectory. In the make file in the source subdirectory we have some generic auto make setup stuff. Um, C flags can be whatever you want it to be. This is the real um, main section of the make file. So this is telling auto make that we have a libtool library called libsysconfcpus.la uh, because LA is the libtool archive extension. Uh, and this library should be installed in the lib subdirectory of wherever the configure prefix is chosen. The next line says that um, the source code for this library is in the libsysconfcpus.c file. Um, likewise, the C flags for this library, minus 01, that could be whatever you like. Uh, and the libad specifies that this library needs minus LDL. Uh, as an additional library. Um, if you can be bothered to write a man page, that's how you tell um, AutoMake that that's where it is. Uh, and it'll correctly install it and so on. And for now, we're just going to have an empty source file. We'll come back and fill it in in a minute. So to generate the configure file, um, there's a few files that AutoConf insists that we have. So for now, we'll just create empty versions of those and fill, fill them back in later. Uh, and then we want auto reconf, and the minus i in this case specifies that missing files should be installed. Um, so auto reconf will go off, uh, it'll run auto make, 
auto header, auto include, all the other auto junk that needs to be run, uh, and it'll install the files that need to be installed. So at the end of this process you have a configure file which you can then run, uh, and it will go ahead and churn away doing its usual thing. Uh, I'm going to install this in a temporary location for now. Uh, you can Once configure is finished, you can run make, and make will churn away and build the code, uh, which in this case is an empty source file, so it's not going to do very much. Um, you can see that in the link line we have minus LDL, and you can also see kind of how libtool works. You run libtool, you tell it we're using a C compiler, and what it should be doing is linking, and then libtool converts that into a GCC minus shared comma um, command and so on. Uh, then we can go and make install, so that'll install, churn away and install all the files. If we have a look in there, we find there's a lib directory, and inside that we have the libtool archive, the um, shared library, and the usual kind of symlinks pointing to that. One of the really nice things about autoconf and, oh well, automake, actually, uh, is that you can just type make dist, and it will generate a tarball for you. So I find that really handy. Um, okay, so now version 0.2, um, adding some debug code. So we're going to add this to the C file. Basically, we're just creating a dprintf, which works like normal printf, except that it's controlled by th this environment variable, whether or not it's set. So that's just an easy way of um, turning on or off debug output. Um, to initialize the library and also um, tear it down at the end, you need to declare um, a void void function. Um, the name of the function can be anything, but you need to include these two magic incantations. Uh, and they tell GCC that this function is the library's in this case, constructor and destructor. Uh, so despite the terminology, this doesn't have anything to do with C++. This just means that when the shared library is loaded, this routine will be this function will be run, and when it's unloaded, this function will be run. We can also add some sh uh, simple supporting shell scripts. So in this case here, we have one called sysconf CPUs. It's actually a template file because the libdo isn't known until after we've run configure. Um, so this basically just sets LD preload and prepends the name of the, um, the library, wherever it's located, to LD preload and then runs whatever the user specified on the command line. So like the glfps um, wrapper function, uh, wrapper command earlier on. Uh, and the same thing again, but debug also just sets this variable. So then we need to add to the make file um, how to go about building the actual shell scripts from the template ones. So we can define just a simple sed command which will take these um, strings that are surrounded by at and replace them with the real versions. And so it'll do it for all of these, but we're only really interested in libdir. Uh, and then you just have a simple rule um, which tells it how to build sysconf CPUs from sysconf CPUs.in, uh, which is fairly straightforward. Um, and in my case, I have the same code for sysconf cpus-debug, and I'm sure you could do it properly, specifying it only once, but I can't remember how to do that in make. Uh, then you also have to tell automake about these scripts so that it knows that they're there and that they need to be built and installed. Uh, so this is how you do it. You specify that you have a script called sysconf cpus. It should be installed in the bin directory, and it shouldn't be included in any tarball that's created by make dist. Uh, on the other hand, you do have these template files, and they're considered just data. They shouldn't be installed, but they should be included in any um, table. And you also want to delete this, the um, script files, the generated script files, when you run make dist clean. Um, so to rebuild, we run make clean. That'll clean up the um, object code. Now we can run auto reconf minus m. So we need to run auto reconf because we've modified the makefile.am files. The minus m tells auto reconf that it should rerun configure with the same options it had previously and uh, then rerun make after that point. So after this command has run, um, we'll have a fully rebuilt 
version of the code, uh, which we can then install with make install. If we have a look, we now see that there's a bin directory which contains the uh, wrapper shell scripts. So now we want to actually intercept uh, the sysconf function. Uh, so this is the real, the main action. Um, so the way you intercept it is the first thing is you have to hash include dl function, of course. Uh, and then we define a function with the exact same signature as the function we're trying to intercept. So it returns a long and accepts an integer as, a, as an argument. We have um, a static void pointer, which is a handle, an opaque handle to the, uh, to the library, and a static function pointer to the underlying uh, sysconf function. So these are static. These will remain the same every time this function is called. Uh, then we also have a regular variable for the return value. So the first time we come through, we run dl open. We tell it the name of the library that we want to open. And we also tell it to bind lazily, uh, which basically means that symbols won't be resolved until they're needed. Um, you can also, there are other options that you can pass in that place. Usually, usually lazy is fine. Um, and you can check the man page for all the gory details on that stuff. So then we take this opaque handle that we got from DL open, pass it to DL sim, which will look up the symbol that we specify here in this library. So this will return a function pointer to the sysconf function out of the C library. So then we can call that as usual, um, pass in the parameter that we were given, and we get the return value from that same function, which we can then return. Um, so this is without any error checking or debug. Um, of course, if this library can't be found, then this will return null, and we should be checking for that and so on. Um, so that's half of the full code there, which I won't dwell on too much. Um, so now if we test this, recompile as before, reinstall, uh, and then test. So if we run our root application, then we see it's spawning off eight threads, uh, because it's an eight core machine. If we then run it via the shared library, now we can see, and with the debug version, so we can see what's going on, we can see the output message from the library when it initializes. Then we can see the application printing out this header here. Then the, um, the preload library is intercepting the sysconf call. Um, 83 is the int that happens to correspond to end processes conf. Uh, we can see that it's got the libc handle from dl open and the function pointer here to the underlying sysconf, uh, to the underlying sysconf function. Uh, it calls it, and the underlying sysconf returns 8, which it then returns, and so we still have 8 threads. So now the idea is we want to actually modify and adjust the behavior of sysconf. Um, so the key thing here is just that before calling the underlying function, we have an opportunity to mess with any of the parameters that were passed in. Uh, and after we've run the underlying function, we can mess with the return value if we want. And so that's exactly what we, what we do. We change the return value in this case, uh, in the specific case we're looking for. So if the name is the number of processes configured, uh, or alternatively the number of processes that are actually online, then in this case we can just look up uh, this environment variable, pull out um, any number that's in there, and use that as our return value. So in this case when we run the, the um, the library that when it has this code in it. If we run the root application through sysconf CPU's debug as before and um, set this environment variable to 2, this time we can see that the underlying sysconf still returns 8 because that's how many CPUs are still in the system and then the preload library changes that to 2, the return value to 2 and returns that and now um, the root application starts up only two threads which is what we wanted. Uh, and then version 0 0.5 has a few extra bits and pieces, uh, a little more configurable, and um, the shell script enhanced to um, take in command line arguments and stuff like that, rather than having to mess around with setting environment variables directly. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can check the website and see how that works. There's one more thing to mention, which is um, one of the GNU extensions um, to the DL function stuff. Uh, and it's very good. Um, 
specially crafted for intercepting functions in this way. Um, it's RTLD next. Uh, you have to hash define use GNU or GNU source uh, before you hash include DL functions in order to get it. But basically it's um, a special void star that you can use in the place of this library handle that you pass to DL sim. So if this handle here is RTLD next, if that's defined, then what this command will do is it tells um, libdl to look up the sysconf symbol from the next library after this current one. And actually it's not just the next one, but it will go as far as necessary uh, through the usual chain of libraries in order to find that symbol. Um, so if this is available, then you, it's definitely a good thing to be using. Um, and if it's not, then you can always just fall back to doing things uh, the slightly bodgier way where if the name of the file is different on some other system, then it won't work. Um, okay, so now we'll have a look at a couple of slightly more crazy advanced things. Um, so xlibtrace is a project that I wrote. Um, so the basic idea is to, accept, uh, to intercept everything in libx11, all of the functions, and then uh, make all of them, make each of them output trace info in the same way that strace or ltrace does. <coughs> um, so there's the question, why not use ltrace? Uh, because it works quite well. Um, there's two main reasons for me anyway. Um, the first is that by doing things this way, I can properly interpret and output um, all of the X specific structures and bit masks and enums and so on, uh, which saves me having to look things up in the header files constantly. Uh, and the other thing is that um, this code then can form the basis for a preload library which wants to intercept a large number of the X calls, which is uh, X multi win, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, it also has the advantage that it's somewhat more portable, um, whereas Ltrace needs to um, be ported to each different architecture. Um, so this is an example of the output that you get from it. So this is one single call to X next event. Um, so the first line here is the unfinished line. So this is printed out when the function's entered. And when the function returns, then it prints it out again with the return value. Um, so you can see that in this case, the event that's returned from X next event, uh, it's a configure event, the serial, the display, and so on. Uh, actually, it's a generated event, which is vaguely interesting. And you can see the windows that um, the event was sent from and that the event refers to and so on. Um, interestingly, you can also see that this program, uh, which is xlogo, is actually recycling its, X, its event return buffer. So this pointer here is the same. And the previous um, event was a reparent notify event. So um, because all of the functions in the preload library basically look like this, so they all have a function pointer to something that looks like themselves, uh, a return value, they look up the corresponding function, if necessary, the first time through, print out the name of the function uh, and the parameters, run the underlying one, print out the return value, and then return. Um, so because they all look like this, um, I, didn't want, I didn't fancy the idea of writing all of these by hand. Um, so I've used the C preprocessor and awk um, to generate all of this code. So in fact, all of these early lines here are just hash defines. This one call here, which is to the C preprocessor macro trace, um, will generate all of the code necessary, which is basically this plus some extra stuff. And um, to do that, it looks up the values that have been previously defined. So in this case, the return type for X clear window is an int. Um, the argument lists for a prototype, so including the types, is here, um, the arg list when you need to call it is there, um, and then um, this, this macro here specifies the arguments to print out. Um, so it's just basically a list of the arguments. So there's an awk um, script which will go through the X header files, which mercifully are formatted decently, 
so that I don't have to parse them properly. Uh, and it will output a huge file that looks like this, which when compiled will generate the correct code um, to intercept all the functions. Um, so the only other thing in that case then is to worry about is how to actually print out the specific types. Um, so in this case here, uh, we specify that the problem is that you can't pass things like this not easily uh, around in C preprocessor macros. Uh, so we have to define these safe types. So putting underscores and P's and stuff like that. Um, and now we can just specify that to print out an X point, which is a structure, you just have to print out a short X, which is the first member, and then a short Y. And so this macro here will generate um, code that looks like this for printing out an X point. Uh, and you can see that this is done in terms of other print type calls. Uh, and so these are nested down and the, um, the bottom level native types are just done by hand as um, just direct fprintfs. Uh, and so similarly for pointers, so f in this case all the pointer functions generally look like this. Um, if the point is non null, then just dereference it. Uh, yep, everything's passed by pointer, so that's why that's not dereferenced. Um, and it should be pre -rated. Yep, so it's dereferenced there. Um, and if it's null, then just print out null. And same for lower level um, pointers. So X multi-win is the main reason that I worked on all this stuff. Um, so I have a multi-head setup, um, which is becoming increasingly common these days. Um, and actually, in my case, there's the additional complication that it's my laptop, um, which sometimes has the, the other screen plugged in and sometimes not. Uh, and I like to be able to just unplug it and move around with it um, without shutting it down. So um, this is the kind of screen that X thinks I have with two Xenorama subscreens. Um, and the problem that I have is that I want some windows shown on both monitors at the same time. So I have a whole bunch of status things down the bottom here, which are just things like um, xload, xbif, stuff like that. Um, and so I want these status things on both, window, on both screens at any time, so that no matter which one I happen to be working on, I can see them. Um, and so in the case of these simple programs, I can just run two copies of them. And that works okay. But there's a lot of things that I'd like to do this for, but I can't, usually because they're not simple enough. So x11 ssh ask pass, so that when I um, enter my pass phrase, the window is visible on both monitors at once. Uh, and other bits and pieces as well, it would be nice to do this with. Um, so the code for this is basically just a prototype at the moment. Um, the idea is intercept everything in libx11 which relates to windows. Uh, in any course to X create window, automatically clone that window. So create a second window that the application knows nothing about. And then any other calls to draw text or draw lines or whatever, um, automatically get sent to both windows. So run once for each window. Um, so this works, but only for xlogo at the moment. So this is one, one process with both logos. Um, and you can see one problem, for example, is the excessive redraws. So the exposed events that are happening when I move this window around are actually being reflected by redraws in both screens. Um, so but this is a good proof of concept that it's actually going to work when I go to the effort of putting in all the functions. Um, so this is just a list of some of the fun that needs to be addressed before this will work properly. Um, so that's all I have. Um, any questions about any of this stuff? I think it's time for a couple of quick questions. Yep. Um, so the RLCD next API is actually a Slurps API. Right, OK. OK, sure. So um, RTLDD next is a Sol uh, Solaris, was it? Yep, so it's a Solaris thing that um, that glibc is copied. Uh, either way, it's not in POSIX, so... Yep, yep. Yep. 
that that's the way to do that, yeah. Because otherwise you end up the second one in the stack will go directly to the source instead of to the next one along. Yep. 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 If you're trying to just put a uh, closed source program and you don't have the headers available to the address, how do you figure out what's the correct function to propose? So uh, it's calling its own libraries that you don't have headers for? Yeah, if they're stripped, then good luck. If they're not stripped, then maybe. Um, I haven't actually tried that. A and actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You'll get at least names. I don't know how much info you'll get about arguments and stuff. I haven't tried. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean the idea behind that, I behind dealing with that sort of problem is that events that are received on a cloned window get translated back to be relative to the original window. Um, so the program will just get duplicate events basically. Yeah, and so it will... Yep. You'll get, yep, so yeah, so you're right, so there's an extra thing that you need to do to catch events like that specifically and deal with them to hide them from the application um, and move the cloned window or resize the cloned window manually. Um, but when, I mean, for example, when a pop-up menu gets created, there should be two copies of that in both locations translated accordingly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if it's quick. Yep, sure. And that's good for debug info as well. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>